What's going on folks? It's Alex here, Mr. Alex Tech. I hope you are well. And today, Blackmagic have released DaVinci Resolve 20.3 for both the free and studio versions of DaVinci Resolve and the iPad. The iPad's got some love as well. DaVinci Resolve 20.3 is available there too. Now, even though it is a somewhat point release, it's a major-ish release because it's a point three, there's not anything too major in here for most of us everyday, relatively casual users. But I'll jump in and I'll show you exactly what we have got. Now, if you're not too sure how to update, all you need to do is either jump over to this website. This is the Blackmagic Support website and you can download DaVinci Resolve 20.3, that's the free version, or DaVinci Resolve Studio 20.3 from there. Or alternatively, probably the easier way, open up your installed version of DaVinci Resolve, click on DaVinci Resolve in the top left-hand corner, then come down to check for updates. This little box will appear and tell you there is a new update to download, and then you can download it and install it from there. So what exactly is new? Well, the kind of headline feature is good news for you Ursa 17K camera users out there, which is like a 20 grand camera. So I don't think many of us are gonna be using it. But if you are using it, good news, because DaVinci Resolve 20.3 can now do up to 32K resolution, 32K resolution support with Apple M5 processors. Now it is seemingly, this is designed for those people that are using the Ursa 17K because it's one of the few cameras that has that kind of resolution. I believe, if memory serves me right, DaVinci Resolve was limited previously to 8K. They can't double that to 16K because they've got a 17K camera. So then they probably just doubled that and went straight up to 32 to kind of future-proof things, I would imagine. Now, if you want to know more about the Blackmagic Ursa Cine 17K, you can go directly to the website. There's a bunch of information on here, and you can even download some camera footage. So they've got a bunch of 17K. I have a look down here. 17, 520 by 80, 40, 17K footage to download and have a little play with for yourself. What a time to be alive when we've got 17K footage. 17K. Crazy. Next up, we've got improved performance for Resolve FX noise reduction. So if you've got noisy footage in DaVinci Resolve, this is limited to those using the studio version because you don't get the noise reduction in the free version. Hopefully now you can run the noise reduction just that little bit quicker. It doesn't specify whether this is just Nvidia, Windows, Mac, so hopefully it's kind of a software-based improvement, which means it should run better for everyone. Next up, timeline backups now allow named snapshots for versioning. This is quite a good one. So you could do timeline backups anyway, and you could set automatic timeline backups, which were handy just to keep track of everything, but they just appeared with basically the date and time. Now you can give them names, which just makes life a little bit easier. You can keep track of those backups so you know what's what. So in Resolve, I've got this timeline here. It's just called Timeline 14. If I right click, come down to Create Timeline Backup, if I go to Restore Timeline Backup, you can see my previous ones. So we've got one at 14.33 and one at 14.26. But if I go Create Timeline Backup, I can actually give this a name before Alex makes a mess. Create. That won't duplicate anything. You won't see that in your actual media pool. But if I right click on Timeline 14 again, Restore Timeline Backups, you can see we've got it at the top with the date and the time, but now we have a name, which just allows you to keep track of those backups. Handy indeed. Support for adding metadata fields as media pool bin columns. Now there's actually a couple of metadata updates in this one. If you're not too sure what I'm talking about with metadata, then it's probably not something you need to worry about. It's a relatively niche thing. Essentially, if I double click on some footage on the edit page, there is a metadata field in the top right hand corner. It will default to these clip details. And we've got basically like the, the camera information that's stored within the clip. So we've got time codes, frames, the shot frame rate, bit depth. If we click on this little icon in the top right hand corner, we can go to the camera details if it's been stored. Not all cameras will store all information. Tech details, there's loads of stuff within here. Now, if we go to our media pool and let's change this to be the list view where we've got these column headings. If we right click, we can customize the columns. You used to just get these default fields, essentially. Now we've got all of this other stuff. This is all of your metadata. So if you do have, let's say, director coming in, you can tick director, move this so we can actually see it, make it a bit easier, and put it right at the top, and then click Save. And now our director information 
is within our columns in our media pool. Now, sticking with metadata, there is also now an option to create custom metadata for unknown fields on import. So again, relatively niche, kind of goes along with the new columns, but if you import some footage and you want to tag it with some custom metadata that you've created, you can now create custom fields. So once again, you can do this from the media page or the edit page. If I open up this clip here, once again, open up metadata. This time I'm gonna click on these three little dots and come to create custom metadata. And then we can just put whatever we like in here choose the field type. Do we want it to be text, text area, numeric, time code, checkbox, whatever. Then click add. And we can add these custom metadata. Once we've added that custom metadata, we can then add it. There is a custom in here somewhere. There it is, to our column headings. And then there's some other relatively niche metadata stuff, but I've talked too much about metadata. So let's move on to something slightly more usable for normal people like us. If you use metadata, I'm not saying you're not normal. I'm not being mean. Let's move on. Media pool views and state and are retained for each project. Relatively simple thing, but quite handy. Although I must admit, I've never noticed that it wasn't there really, but now it is there, I guess it's beneficial. And it basically just means that anything you do to the media pool, the way that you organize it, if you close it and then come back, that's how it will remain. So in this project, let's expand footage and click on Lime. Now we're in this Lime bin, this Lime folder. If we were to go to a different project and then just go back to that one, it will automatically jump us back to this Lime bin, this Lime project. So it just remembers where you were. So you can jump back and forth or even come out of DaVinci Resolve and come back in and you'll still be in the bin looking at the footage you probably want to be looking at, potentially. Now, sticking with the media pool, you can now assign a keyboard shortcut in the media pool to start a search. So previously, you'd go magnifying glass and then typey, typey, typey. Now, if we go to DaVinci Resolve, then come down to keyboard customization, and then in this search box, simply type search, and you will see media pool search. And then we can put something in here. So let's just try control and S. Cool, that's not taken. Then we can click save, close this down. And now whenever we click within our media pool, doesn't matter what bin we're in, we can simply do a control and S. That's gonna open up our search and then we can search within there. You might not want control S by the way. That's just what I've just done for this example. Create your own, do what you like. But control and S can do multiple things in different places. There is now an edit menu action to insert a gap at playhead. Again, this is quite a handy one. I've got so used to just doing alt or option and Y and you can move things along, but now you can just insert gaps wherever the playhead is. And yes, you can also assign this a keyboard shortcut if you want to. So previously what I've always done is you put your playhead where you want, hit alt and Y or option and Y if you're on a Mac, and then you can move things along. But it does this. If you've got a clip spanning the whole thing, it selects everything. Now what you can do, put your playhead wherever you want, then go to edit at the very top, come down, there is an insert gap, and then that will just insert a gap just like so. Now you can also assign a keyboard shortcut, so if you click on DaVinci Resolve top left hand corner, then come down to keyboard customization, in the little search box, just search for insert gap, and you will see edit, insert gap, and you can assign a keyboard shortcut. I'm gonna go with something like Control and G. That'll do. And then click Save. Then we can close that down. And then at any point, I can move my playhead, hit Control and G to add a gap. Now you can amend the size, the length of the default gap that's created, but it took me a while to figure out because it's a little bit strange. Doesn't make total sense where it is, but let me show you how to do it. All you need to do is click on DaVinci Resolve top left-hand corner then come to Preferences, then go to User, Editing, scroll down to the General Settings, and I expected to see a standard gap duration or something like that, but instead it's using the standard still duration duration. So mine is currently five seconds. If I change that to two seconds, or I could change it to frames instead if I wanted to, then hit Save, then I'll do my Control and G once again, and now we're only adding a two second gap. Why it's on stills, I don't know. Seems odd, but you can adjust it. So there you go. Right, next up, 
They've added 2.39 and 2.40 broadcast safe aspect ratios. So if you like to use the safe zones, this is a big thing for me. I love to shoot anamorphic. We can now put a anamorphic sized, the ultra wide, the 2.39, 2.4, the standard aspect ratio for cinema. We now have like a safe zone gritty thing. So just above your preview screen, you've got this little drop down, and then we've got like social media overlays so we can know if we were to export this out in a 9x16 vertical resolution, that's what we would be getting. We now have 2.39 and 2.4. Now, quick note, I noticed this when I was doing it. If we turn everything off, if we tick 9x16, it will automatically appear. If we do 2.39 or 2.4, nothing appears. You have to make sure you have the extents on. So the broadcast and film seems to work differently from the social media. Social media, you don't need anything on. But for these two, well, and all of these, you do. So just a quick thing there. There's very little difference between 2.39 and 2.4, but they've given you both options. Right, improved, what was it? Oh yeah, improved match frame behavior for clips with negative speeds. So this was obviously an issue. It's not something I ever came across, but match frame would clearly break if you were using negative or reverse playback. Now, I'm not gonna dwell on this too long, but just on the off chance you don't know what match frame is, let me show you because it's a genuinely really useful thing to know. So match frame is this icon here, or the keyboard shortcut is simply the F key. So I've got this audio and video, it's all linked up here, as you'd expect on the timeline. But let's pretend I'd accidentally deleted the audio. If I give this clip, this just this video now, a click on the timeline, then hits the F key, it will not only find that source media within the media pool, it will mark that exact in and out. So this is the exact section of that clip that's being used on this timeline right here. So then I can just click and drag to bring down that entire thing with the video and the audio. Or in my instance, let's just go F. Let's say I want to grab that audio section back. I can click on this icon, drag it down, I've brought the right audio section for this clip on the timeline. I can then just highlight them both, right click and link the clips, and now we're good to go. It was obviously broken and doing weird things. They fixed it, cool, but now you know what match frame is if you didn't before. Now there are some other things I didn't mention or I haven't really gone into. Oh, I got an itch. So we've got things like support for IMF workflows, ability to embed HDR10 metadata in QuickTime and MP4, stereoscopic mode in clip attributes, and then they've addressed some clearly known issues, and then there's some general performance and stability improvements as well. Your general stuff they like to add in to make things better. Now, as mentioned at the beginning, if you're an iPad user, 20.3 is available on the iPad as well. You just need to download the update from the store, install that, and you'll be good to go. Now, it appears the iPad version gets pretty much all of the same features. It gets most of the same updates, but there is also one iPad specific improvement, but only if you're using one of the latest iPads. So you can see down here, what's new. We now have the ability to render in the background on iPad OS 26 with M4 and newer chips. Now, if you're using the latest version with one of the newest M4 or later chips, you can actually like open something else, browse the internet, play some mini motors or whatever game you like to play, and the DaVinci Resolve will continue rendering out to your video in the background. So there you go. Anyway, let's wrap this up. I hope you found this useful. There are obviously some other things I haven't mentioned, but those are the key things which I think are the most important and hopefully beneficial to everyone. As always, leave me your comments, your thoughts, your feelings, your abuse, whatever you want to do down in the comments section below. Thank you for watching. See you next time.